All right, good evening. If you want to grab your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8 is where we will begin this evening. And as you're turning there, let me just say, good to be home. We had a good time. Uh, down Pepperdine Way, and then a good time in the nation's capital. And uh, I'm thinking probably during the Monday night upcoming broadcast on Facebook, I'll give the, the full report of um, our time down at Pepperdine and uh, what uh, what I got into while I was down there. So in the meantime, here we are in First Samuel chapter 8 as we continue our study from eternity to eternity, walking through God's story uh, from the beginning of time all the way to the end of time. And we approach now the monarchy. Uh, last week, uh, Buddy brought us through the judges, and now we come to the monarchy. 1 Samuel 8, beginning in verse 1. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving to the gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Let us pray. Lord God, as we turn our attention to the kingdom of Israel, the monarchy, Pray that we would see clearly <clears throat> how you established your king in Israel and what lessons can be gleaned from this history for us even today. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, it's been a uh, couple years since we transitioned from our formal way of doing things on Thursday to how we have them now. Uh, it used to be that the shower shuttle itself would show up on Thursdays. Uh, the bus that uh, Dean, who oversees the shower shuttle, the bus had been uh, converted from a people mover, and now it had two stalls for folks to take showers. That would show up on Thursdays, and then we kind of did stuff uh, indoors, meals, and that sort of thing. Now, uh, it is not shower shuttle that shows up, but the laundry shuttle. And we have showers here on site, and we utilize those showers. Uh, we are uh, much more uh, self-contained in that way uh, on Thursday. But back when the shower shuttle would come to our location, there were a couple of volunteers who would show up with it. One of those volunteers was a man named Daryl. Daryl is a, a devout Christian, a godly man, and uh, one day... We were sitting out uh, outside in the back where the shower shuttle was, and I'm sitting there, and Daryl's sitting there, and some of the clientele for the shower shuttle are milling about and doing what they're doing. And I remember as, as we were all kind of talking, one of the folks there was saying how they, they didn't know what to read next in the Bible. As I recall, they were saying that they had read through the Gospels, uh, maybe Genesis and, and Exodus, and they didn't really know where to go after that. And so I thought for a second, and I said, uh, 
I asked him, well, do you like Game of Thrones? And uh, Game of Thrones, of course, popular TV show based on the books by George R. R. Martin. Uh, I've never read one of the books, never seen an episode of the show, but I have kind of an idea of what the show's about, about all these uh, kings and uh, rulers trying to gain power. Kind of a common motif, yeah. So I said, do you like Game of Thrones? And the person I was talking to said, well, I, yeah, I love Game of Thrones. I said, well, you should read First Second Samuel and First Second Kings. That's that's biblical Game of Thrones right there. That's Game of Thrones before George R. R. Martin ever walked a planet. And uh, they said, oh yeah, I'll do that. It's great. Daryl is sitting next to me. He's listening to all this, right? And uh, he's 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 sitting there. He's, he's floored by my answer. He's like, oh man. He says, man, what a great connection. I never thought about that. That. Uh, First, Second Samuel, First, Second King. That's that's Game of Thrones, but uh, the biblical version. That's that's, and I never would have put those things together. And uh, in fact, Daryl was so impressed that minutes later he was still geeking out about. It. He was like, man, I, Game of Thrones is such a great connection. I think he came back a few months later and he was still saying, man, I still remember that Game of Thrones connection. First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings is the narrative of Israel's monarchy which quickly devolves into a divided kingdom. And long before George R. R. Martin ever wrote a single word uh, of Game of Thrones, and as I understand it, it's a, it's a painstaking process for him to actually write the books. He's lucky to get just a few hundred words out. I can appreciate that as myself, somewhat of a writer. Uh, that's, it's a tough thing to do. Long before Game of Thrones was ever a book series or a popular TV show, Here we have, to a greater degree, Lord Yahweh's Game of Thrones, where Yahweh is forging His empire. He is raising up kings. He is bringing kings down. It is not unlike what Hannah prays in chapter 2. The prayer of Hannah, in fact, sets the trajectory for the 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings epic. And she prays there in 1st Samuel 2, Verses 6-10, through 10, Yahweh kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and He raises up. Yahweh makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and He exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are Yahweh's, and on them He has set the world. He will guard the feet of His faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of Yahweh shall be broken to pieces. Against them He will thunder in heaven. Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to His King and exalt the horn of His anointed. And if there is a game of thrones, it is Yahweh's game. Just without all the dragons and all that, all right? Um, God here in 1 Samuel initiates, He governs, and He overrules the monarchy in Israel. Now, to appreciate the Game of Thrones here in Scripture, it actually begins way back in the beginning of the book. (laughs) Go figure, right? Begin at the beginning. Chapter 1 of 1 Samuel begins with a rivalry. And a prayer. There are two women, Hannah and Penina. They are married to one man, Elkanah. We are told that Yahweh had closed the womb of Hannah. There in 1 and verse 5. Penina, on the other hand, was apparently fertile myrtle, right? I mean, just popping out kids for Elkanah. And Penina was not one to just let bygones be bygones. She just had to rub Hannah's face in it. And we are told in verse 6 that her rival, Penina, used to provoke her, that is Hannah, grievously to irritate her because Yahweh had closed her womb. Literally, the text says that Penina grieved Hannah with grief to humiliate her. Um, 
Probably not the most pleasant woman to be around, right? And this persisted year after year. Year after year, year in and year out, Hannah is subjected, not just to the, the own, her own private world of shame that came along with barrenness, but she was also subjected to the public ridicule that came from her rival wife. All this only adds insult to injury. But one year, Hannah, the thing about pain, suffering, uh, things like barrenness, that's part of the pain and suffering in the world, is for many people it drives them away. They are embittered because of their lot in life, which is given to us by God. I mean, the text is plain. Yahweh closed Hannah's womb. Now you can try to explain that away, and well, but really what it means is, the text says what it says. That's your starting point for this. And for understanding, and, and even producing a, uh, a, a form of apologetic for explaining pain and suffering in the world. And again, that, that can embitter people. It could have done the same thing to Hannah. But she refuses that, doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. I'm sure she, she carried that around. But what happened is it actually drove her to God. Because what happens is she prays to God. And apparently there's some fasting involved uh, because she refused to eat, verse 7 tells us as well. And she is deeply distressed and she prays to Yahweh and she weeps bitterly, and she vows a vow in the midst of her prayers, and she says in verse 11, O Lord of hosts, don't miss this, because we can get wrapped around the request itself, because she does pray for a son, but notice that the request is couched deep in the midst of a, a prayer which accentuates the majestic God. O Yahweh of hosts. And that is a title which accentuates God as the captain and commander of the angelic armies of heaven. Wow. And it has a very high theology. Oh, Yahweh of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant. And... And again, notice how big God is to her. I'm just a servant. I'm, I'm just a creature. You're the big God here. But remember me. But we'll give your servant a son. Then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life. No razor shall touch his head. And you have here a, a beautiful theology of giving God gives to us, and then we give back what He has given to us. Yeah, Here, it's, it's with a child. And of course, the story continues. Uh, the priest, uh, Eli, he happens to see her. Hannah apparently is the first person to pray the silent prayer. She prayed in her heart, uh, uh, is what the text says. Uh, verse 13, Hannah was speaking in her heart. Her lips are moving, but she's not saying anything. And prior to this, apparently when you prayed, you did it vocally, out loud. Here is Hannah, and it's a, it's a private thing. Speaking in her heart, and her lips moving, and Eli sees this. Uh, you worthless woman. <laughs> Got to wonder what kind of pastor that uh, Eli was, but uh, you know, there's something to be said about calling people on the carpet and calling things as they are. Uh, wh what are you doing? You should give, away, uh, give up your drinking. right? And she says, uh, I'm not drunk, I'm praying and and uh, they have a, an exchange here may the God of Israel grant you your petition and in fact that's what happens Hannah conceives uh, and of course understanding that it is Yahweh who grants conception he's not only the one who uh, closes the womb he's the one who opens the womb as well that's attested to in scripture and she has she has a son calls his name Samuel and she the their, their tradition was to go up every year to the temple, offer sacrifice, and once the child is born, she says, well, I'll go once I've weaned him, 
would have been around five or seven years old when that happened. And so finally, once he's weaned, then she presents him to the temple where he goes in to minister there. It is out of this, this whole episode, that we get to chapter 2 and Hannah's prayer. And again, Hannah's prayer sets the trajectory here for God's involvement in His, in his world, but especially in His kingdom. And, and we're going to see phrases, we'll, we'll go over several of them in just a few minutes, where we see God active in doing stuff in His kingdom. But here, again, Hannah, and, and, and there's, there's, a, there's an arrow, if you will, that, that is shot through the prayer or the song that Miriam sings once the children of Israel come across a dried up Red Sea in Exodus 15. That arrow flies through Miriam's song, hits through here in Hannah's Magnificat, as it were, my soul magnifies God, and it goes straight all the way to the prayer that Mary will pray in her Magnificat in Luke chapter uh, in Luke chapter one, when when she prays a similar thing, my soul magnifies uh, God and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, and so there's that connection to the larger overarching narrative of Scripture. Exodus to Exodus, as it were. Moses to the greater than Moses. And there's, there's also a contrast here between Hannah, who is a, a woman of righteousness, and yet is mistaken by Eli for being a worthless woman, and Eli with his sons, who the text tells us plainly, they are worthless men. Their lives are all wrapped up in immorality and oppression, and utilizing the temple system for their own personal gain and the distortion of true religion into something it is not supposed to be, taking advantage of the women of the temple and things like that. Awful, awful guys. Eli does his best to call them on the carpet, but alas, it's too late because we are told it was the will of Yahweh to put them to death. Wow, you don't want that ever to be an epilogue to your life. And yet that's where Eli's sons are. You have the, the account of the boy, Samuel, and he's called in the middle of the night by the Lord. He mistakes it for the call of Eli. Here am I. Uh, here I am, sir. And after a few times of that happening, Eli tells Samuel, go back, lay down. When you hear the call, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And that is when the Lord reveals himself to Samuel. Of course, we can't overlook the fact that verse 1 of chapter 3 begins with the fact that the word of Yahweh was rare in those days. No vision. Hmm. We'll come back to that also. You have the Philistines capturing the Ark of the Covenant in chapter 4, but even this is apparently by design because Yahweh wants to pass judgment upon the Philistines. And he does that through... Uh, a series of coincidences, okay? Coincidence is just when God chooses to remain anonymous, right? But he's the one who's in charge of this. And even the Philistines are like, you can't compete with this guy. He's cutting off Dagon's head and hands, right? Which is fascinating because Dagon's hands are cut off, but we're told that the hand of Yahweh was heavy upon the people of Ashdod and everywhere that the Ark of the Covenant went among the Philistines, God's hand was heavy upon them. Dagon's hands get cut off. Yahweh's hand is very much involved. You have that striking contrast there as well. That brings us finally to uh, chapter 8, where we just read about where the people say, give us a king, but really uh, their words don't match their heart. They are saying one thing, but there are apparently intentions that are beneath the surface that only God knows about. Uh, and he says, well, they're, they've rejected me as their king. It is Saul who is chosen, and I'll circle back to that as well here in a moment. Uh, we are familiar, I think, with most of the story of Saul, how he is eventually rejected by God, and it is David who is anointed and chosen to be the king, and there's a long feud between David and Saul throughout the rest of Saul's life. Saul, once he dies, then David ascends to the throne. And we'll deal more with that next week when we take a closer look at the life of David because how can I mean how could you not, right? We need to spend some time with that. What I want to focus on is a particular phrase in 1 Samuel 13, 
which I think we're familiar with, uh, where the, the text reads, but now your kingdom shall not continue. This is uh, Samuel talking to Saul after Saul has once again fumbled the ball and shown uh, uh, a disregard for moral fortitude and, and the law of God. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Yahweh has sought out a man after his own heart, and Yahweh has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what Yahweh commanded you. A man after God's own heart. That phrase, usually we apply it to David. Right? David is this man after God's own heart. And, and, and what we mean by that is he is a man who follows hard after God. He is devoted to God. He honors God with his life. In fact, uh, in our own brotherhood, Brother Burton Kaufman, in his commentary on 1 Samuel, I think provides us with what we usually mean when we talk about David as a man after God's own heart. And the context for the comments that Kaufman is writing here, which I'm going to quote at some length, is in response to those who would say, well, how can the text say he's a man after God's own heart when we know the David story? And we know Bathsheba is coming. And that whole episode that is involved with murder, deception, adultery, all this kind of good stuff that makes for great Game of Thrones stuff, right? Yeah, well, how can the text say that he's a man after God's own heart when he's a gross moral failure like the rest of us? Where's God's justice? Well, Kaufman responds in this way. He says, In the character of David, despite his weakness and sins, there was an invariable purpose of honoring God as the true king of Israel. He submitted in penitence to the rebuke of Nathan. He acknowledged the justice and loving kindness of God in all the shameful punishments heaped upon him as a consequence of his sins even in the rape and incest that fell upon members of his family and in the rebellion of Absalom, in all those divine punishments, and that is what they were, David acknowledged the justice, mercy, and loving kindness of God. In the light of all these facts, any thoughtful person can easily understand why God chose David and rejected Saul. End quote, right? And again, that's typically how we understand that phrase. David is this man after God's own heart. David is, is following hard after God. He is zealous for God. And he honors God. And, and all that is true. It is all true. However, this same phrase is used later on in the David story. And rarely is this connection ever made, but I want to bring it to your attention. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And I want to read verses 20 and 21. After God has promised, we spent some time, it was weeks ago, but we spent some time in this chapter. This is a, a significant chapter in biblical history because this is the promise of God to David concerning one who would sit on his throne. And here is David in response, praying a prayer of gratitude to God. And it reads in part, beginning in verse 20, but what more can David say to you, for you know your servant, O Lord God? Because of your promise, and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Now that phrase there, according to your own heart, is uh, the same phrase that's used Back here in 1 uh, 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. A man after his own heart. Or literally, a man according to his own heart. That is God's own heart. It is according to God's own heart that uh, uh, that is the characteristic that defines David. Which I think, uh, reading these two verses in concert and in harmony with one another, I think brings into view what we mean here, or what is meant here, when it, when it is saying that David is a man according to God's own heart, or according to your heart. In fact, David is giving his own Holy Spirit-inspired uh, interpretation of what is meant there. It is because of your promise, and according to your own heart, that all this stuff 
is going to going to take place. Uh, Hamilton, in his book uh, God's Glory in Salvation Through Judgment, recognizes this, and he puts it this way: He says, "It is not David's heart, but Yahweh's purpose that is in view." In other words, it's Yahweh's heart that's in view here. David confesses in Second Samuel seven twenty one that Yahweh has acted according to his own heart, meaning according to his own purpose. And the Hebrew expression is the same in both of those texts. And so that, I think, underscores the fundamental difference between David and Saul. It is not that David is a righteous man and Saul is not. We know how the David story goes. He shows himself to be of the same stock as the rest of us, a man with clay feet and prone to wander from the Lord in his particular way. Rather, David is God's man according to God's own heart, according to God's purpose, God's eternal purpose. Well, then what about Saul? I mean, after all, he's, he's the first one. He's the first king in Israel, right? Yes, but Saul, on the other hand, is God's gift, if you will, in judgment upon Israel for their rejection of him. In fact, a closer look at the, the life of Saul, I think, bears this out. Most of us, in fact, uh, for most of my uh, life, reading the, the narrative of Saul's life, I think most of us are inclined to give Saul the benefit of the doubt. That he was a, he was a good guy, but eh, you know, he just, he's a good guy gone bad. Um, he started off with a lot of promise, but then that character just spoiled, right? It just He made a bunch of bad choices and you know, ended up where he ended up. I want to submit to you that everything about Saul's life is actually negative from the very first introduction that we have of him. Uh, I'll invite you to go back and give a close reading to 1 Samuel chapter 9, where we are first introduced to Saul. He's commissioned by his daddy. Go find the lost donkeys. So Saul goes out, and he's got a servant with him, and they can't find him. He fails in finding his dad's lost donkeys. And in fact, they get to a point where he's like, all right, servant, let's go on home. I don't want dad worrying about me like he's worried about the donkeys, right? And it's the servant who has to talk him into going to go see Samuel. Well, wait a minute. Uh, just over in this town over here is, is the prophet Samuel. We should go inquire of him. Saul is actually trying to talk him out of it. No. We, how are we going to pay him? He doesn't have any money. The servant who says, I got the coin on me. All right, I got some greenbacks, right? Here's a few shekels. Let's go over and talk to this guy. We can pay him. It is the servant who is showing himself more resourceful, more intuitive, than Saul. Hmm. Also, when Yahweh announces to Samuel that Saul will be king, he doesn't say, this is the guy that I have to deliver my people. You look at 9 and verse 17 of 1 Samuel, it says that he it is who shall restrain my people. Very different. And, and I think that's borne out when a little later on the, the Chapter 14, the, the men of Saul are trying to eat the blood of the meat that they've just killed because they're so hungry because Saul has had this ban on eating for uh, until David's dead. and Saul has to restrain them from doing that. Of course, in chapter 10, one may be tempted to see here in verses 6 and 9 where we read that uh, the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you. You will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Uh, to, to see here, and also in verse 9, uh, when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. There may be an inclination to see here, and, and I admit that I've even read it that way as well, that this is uh, some kind of conversion, right? He became a new man. When in fact, what is very interesting is when you take a closer look at the word that's used there for turned, uh, when it says that God changed him or turned him uh, that what is said there is used elsewhere in the Old Testament, and it's never used in the context of conversion. Let me give you just one example of where it's used in uh, Psalm 105 and verse 25. Psalm 105, 25 says that he 
that is Yahweh, talking about the people of Egypt, He turned their hearts to hate His people, uh, to deal craftily with His servants. And so it's not necessarily a change for the better. It could be a change for the worse. In fact, what is typically used for conversion in the Old Testament, regeneration if you will, is language like, you must have your heart circumcised. You're, anything about the heart, it must be circumcised, right? That's the language of conversion in the Hebrew Bible. Saul never displays any of that. He never displays a true conversion of heart, true circumcision of the heart. In fact, when it's all said and done, Saul ends up being more or less an empty suit. Impressive to look at, without a doubt. Head and shoulders above everybody. Just a gross moral failure, lacking moral fortitude all along the way, every step of the way. Uh, perhaps the prime example of this is when it is finally announced, here's your king to the people of Israel, where's Saul? He's hiding over in the baggage. That's not a sign of humility. When you are avoiding the call of God upon your life in the baggage. That is uh, false humility. One of the uh, overarching themes that we've been following along with uh, Hamilton in his book is God's glory and salvation through judgment. And that is a theme that unifies all of Scripture. And the period of the monarchy in Israel is a time that is rife with salvation through judgment to God's glory. starts all the way back with that birth of Samuel. That is God vindicating His faithful servant Hannah. While at the same time, uh, he is vindicating his servant against her enemy, Penina, by uh, giving graciously this child to Hannah. And then it's really writ large on the whole life of Saul. Uh, Saul is given as judgment upon the people of Israel for their rejection and the rebellion against Yahweh. But then even that story uh, continues with the ascension of David. And David, his ascendancy to the throne is a judgment upon Saul. And yet Saul's judgment that results in the anointing of David also further brings about salvation for God's people as a true king in Israel rises to power. And then there's that whole David and Goliath episode where you have the judgment of God visited upon the Philistines in the representative of Goliath, the deliverance of God through the shepherd boy, David, and in rather spectacular fashion, God is bringing about salvation for His people. And in all that, God is glorified in doing that. And then, I may be getting ahead of myself here with the David study looming next week, but we can't miss the larger picture here that goes all the way back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. Now, there will be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And it's, it's as if you have in David the seed of the woman smiting on the head the seed of the serpent, Goliath. Yeah? And in all that, he's delivering his people. Wow. More on that next time. What does it mean for us today? <clears throat> Coming back to 1 Samuel chapter 8. You have the rejection of Yahweh. And I think we need to <clears throat> carefully parse here, as I mentioned earlier, between the people's words and their intentions. Because their words do not reflect the intentions of their heart. What they say is, give us a king. It's the request. Asking for the king in and of itself, not a bad thing. Not an evil thing. In fact, I would say that if they actually had true motivations in their heart, uh, that would be a good thing. I mean, after all, in the law, you have law that is given, stipulations in the, the Torah concerning the king and how the king's supposed to act. And, and that's in Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 through 20. So that anticipates there will be a monarchy uh, which will be representative of the larger theocracy where the king is to act as representative of King Yahweh here on earth. And there's supposed to be that connection, which all anticipates the coming kingdom of Christ. How he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. 
Again, give us a king. In and of itself, not, a, not an evil thing, not a bad thing. What is particularly grievous and, and evil in what they are requesting is, and what they are guilty of is rejecting Yahweh. And that is what Yahweh sees. He looks beyond their words right down to the intentions of their hearts. He knows what's in their hearts. That's why he says in verse 7, they have rejected me as being king over them. They are forsaking me. Verse uh, 8 says, serving other gods. And what that shows us is uh, we need to recognize God sees our hearts. Uh, he is the God who sees hearts. You may talk a good game, but where's your heart? How's your heart? God knows our heart. Be not deceived, Scripture says. God is not mocked. No one's going to game God. No one's going to get a free lunch on God, right? Uh, no one is going to pull a fast one on God. God knows the heart. He sees the heart. And we need to be aware and guard our heart, as the Proverbs say. And we also need to see to it that our words match our intentions. Those, those need to go together. We cannot say one thing while meaning another. Uh, in fact, one of the kings of Israel saying, You, God, you delight in truth in the inward being. Of course, that was King David in Psalm 51 and verse 6. That's what God delights in, truth in the inward being. Because that truth in the inward being ought to manifest itself externally in the things that we say and the actions that we do. So true intentions and true words, they ought to go together and those ought to mark the walk of uh, everyone who claims to follow after God. Uh, what else does this mean for us? Um, I mentioned as we were beginning the lesson that there were several phrases that are peppered throughout the, uh, the all of First, Second, Samuel, First, Second Kings. But in particular, the beginning of the monarchy here, I want to key in on, on several phrases that show up. 1 verse 5, where we are told that Yahweh had closed Hannah's womb. Yahweh closed her womb. 2 verse 25, in talking about the sons of Eli, it was the will of Yahweh to put them to death. Eli, his response to this revelation, he says, it is Yahweh. Let him do what seems good to him. 3 verse 18. I mentioned earlier about the hand of Yahweh was heavy upon the people of Ashdod and everywhere that the ark went. In chapter 5, verse 6, Israel, we are told they would cry out because of the oppression of their king. But, 8 verse 18 says, Yahweh will not answer you on that day. Uh, then we read about how Saul, when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God turned, or it could be read as God overturned his heart. And that doesn't necessarily mean a change for the good. In fact, it may indicate a change for the worse. God did that. And then in chapter 15, verse 26, that culminates the whole Saul story, as it were, in the overturn of this. Yahweh, Samuel, talking to Saul, Yahweh has rejected you from being king over Israel. Yahweh acts again and again, and it shows us Yahweh is the main star of the drama of human history. Yahweh is the key player in the Game of Thrones, if you will. Are we okay with that? <laughs> are we okay with that? I, I think there are some folks uh, who want to be the star. They want to be the key player in life. Uh, maybe even not a few Christians want that starring role. They think they're the center of attention. That they're the ones who are on center stage. But the monarchy reminds us this is a theocracy. King Yahweh is sovereign over His creation. God is center stage. And we would do well to mark it down and put it where we keep sacred truth. Yahweh is the star of all of this. And we ought to delight in that. It is Hannah's prayer <clears throat> that reflects a heart delighting in the sovereignty of God. She is a saint who recognizes the sovereignty of God. We read those words earlier. Yahweh kills and Yahweh brings to life. He brings down to Sheol. He raises up. He makes poor. He makes rich. He brings low. He exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. Again, is indicative of a heart that is 
consumed with the sovereignty of God, uh, who is her prayer is saturated with the sovereignty of God, and and humble reverence at the mad, the majestic sovereignty of God. That's the appropriate course of action for us creatures to uh, honor Him and give Him thanks. That is the whole duty of everyone. So Hannah, her prayer informs our prayer as well. It shows us prayer begins and ends with God. Prayer is not egotistical. It is not self-centered. We can make it that way. I think uh, often it's, it's just a laundry list of things that we want. We approach God, Lord God, and then we cut right into, here's what I want you to do. Uh, Hannah, it's true, her first prayer is a request. But again, it's couched in that language which magnifies God and accentuates God. And, uh, and, and so her prayer becomes this joyful expression as she's captivated by her God. And indeed, that's what it takes for us as well. What ought to characterize our prayer? Hearts that delight in the sovereignty of God. That, that, that delight in the, the majesty of magnifying the Lord of hosts. Our times are not unlike uh, these Bible times. 3 verse 1, again, we were reminded that the, the word of the Lord was rare. And I would say that today it is rare. It is rarely read, rarely revered. Rarely truly preached, rarely observed by people, rarely honored as God's Word. We're told in their day there was no vision, no frequent vision. And I think a a similar thing is true today. There's no frequent vision. That is a a vision of God and and, uh, seeing Him as holy and majestic and righteous. And people still express the utter depravity of their hearts in grieving others with griefs and viciously provoking others to... Uh, to despondency and despair and sorrow, committing these low, base deeds year after year, year in and year out, as Penina did with Hannah. What's the solution for such evil days? I think Hannah gives us a clear vision, prayer, which recognizes, even celebrates, the sovereignty of the King of the universe that sees God as the sovereign Lord. That's how the early church prayed. Acts 4, go back and read it and see how they started. Sovereign Lord. Even when faced with persecution and trials from without, they had a clear vision of a God who is big. We need to make God big in our hearts, in our minds, and truly honor Him for who He really is. Not as we want Him to be or as we think He should be, but as He has revealed Himself in Scripture. Prayer that acknowledges the all-pervasive providence of God in life, in death, and in everything. And with that, let's go to God in prayer. And then we'll have a final word. <clears throat> Sovereign Lord, who is over all, through all, and in all, We give you praise for how you overruled and governed this game of thrones, the monarchy in Israel. We pray, Father, that we would look to you as the one who gives us your word, the one who can enlighten the eyes of our hearts, We pray that we would see You for the holy and majestic Sovereign Lord that You are in all things. Glory to the Father, the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, as now and more shall be, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.